Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you for coming at the first day of the semester. Today we have Wicca and Eva to give a talk about their new work, doubly efficient private information retrieval and fully homomorphic RAM computation. Because this is a really cool work, we separated it into two parts. The first part will be given by Ethan, and he will talk about the introductory level, like let us know what is this problem is about and what they do in this paper. And then we'll have a launch break. After the launch break, we can we'll talk more about the technical parts. Let's welcome them. Uh, okay. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Ethan. Uh, so this is a uh, joint work with Weikai here, who's going to give the second part of the talk, as well as Daniel Wicks. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, oh no, click, there we go. Is this working? Why is this not working? One second. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned, uh, this is just part one of this talk. So I'll just be giving uh, mostly the high level overview of, uh, you know, like the goal and the motivation of the problem and our results and uh, some brief high level description of, of our technique for the doubly efficient uh, private information retrieval part. But uh, I'll leave must um, uh, some many of the technical details for Wakeye's talk after lunch. <clears throat> so to begin, uh, so I we have this, uh, our motivating example is that of, uh, say you want to search something on Google. We have Alice here who is trying to make some Google search query and say it's some, you know, private query that she wants uh, to make about some medical condition, for instance. And, you know, she uh, does, performs a normal Google search query. She expects to get, you know, normal Google results. Um, but the question is, is uh, can she do this in a way that you know, maybe she doesn't want to reveal the, the private uh, medical condition that she's searching. And so she wants no one to be able to read what her query is. Um, so normal cryptographic techniques, such as just normal encryption, kind of handle this for other parties out here, out in, in like normal space. However, but what about uh, keeping it private from Google itself? Uh, and so, you know, at a high level, what she wants is she wants somebody to encrypt her query and then she'll send it to Google and Google uh, won't have any idea what her query is, but nonetheless, will still be able to uh, send back an encrypted response that Alice can then decrypt. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, we have this object called fully homomorphic encryption that seems to kind of give you exactly what you want here. It's a way that we can privately evaluate an arbitrary function. And so kind of the way it would work is Alice maybe encrypts her query under some uh, FAG scheme. Google is then able to evaluate whatever its monolithic, huge, complex Google search function is and send back uh, an encryption of the response. However, there's a major, major caveat here, which is that uh, FAG schemes that we know of uh, operate in the circuit model. And what this means is that since uh, in, the, in the circuit model, the circuit size uh, always depends on the, like is at least linear in the input sizes, uh, Google would need to like read the entire internet or its entire, at least its entire index of the internet every time it wants to respond to a search query. And this is uh, very unsatisfying for Google because Google wants to answer a lot of queries very quickly. And so this work, uh, we uh, construct uh, FHE for RAM computation. And uh, at a very high level, the way this will work is that Google pre-processes its index of the internet into some data structure. And then using this data structure, it can later make uh, like answer future Google search queries uh, using only few, like only looking up very few locations in this data structure. <clears throat> and uh, so to begin with in this talk, I'm gonna talk about this uh, simpler problem uh, which is uh, doubly efficient private information retrieval. Uh, and then I'll uh, move on to uh, give you the model of RAM FHE and our results in that. And then I'll uh, cover the, at least the very high level techniques of our, our deep ear construction, leaving our RAM FHE construction for Wakeye's talk after lunch, as well as uh, some of the more, uh, like some of the final, finer parts of our, our deep ear construction. 
Um, <clears throat> so uh, private information retrieval is a well-studied object that was introduced uh, just a little before or in the year 2000, <clears throat> where the main goal of this object is that Alice has is trying to interact with a server that holds a database of like some large database. And she wants to just read it, uh, some index from that database. And ideally, she wants to read this uh, read an index from this database without revealing to the server what she has read. And so you could imagine this server is something like uh, you know Netflix or a streaming service, and she you know what like knows what movie she wants to watch, but she doesn't want to reveal to Netflix what movie she's watching. <clears throat> And uh, there is an obvious trivial solution here, which is Netflix could just send all movies of all time that it owns to Alice. And then Alice could just look up in this massive stream of data, the movie she wants to watch. Um, but this is very unsatisfying because that's like a lot of movies and Alice doesn't wanna have to comb through all the movies herself. And uh, so it's, it's kind of long been known that uh, using uh, cryptographic techniques, we can actually achieve this and we can get that the communication of the protocol is overall polylogarithmic and the size of the database. <clears throat> um, however, there's again this uh, big caveat here that during all protocols that we know of for private information retrieval, the server reads the entire database during the protocol and thus the server computation is at least linear in the database size. And in fact, this is inherent if the server only stores the database. And uh, it's a very simple proof for this. Uh, imagine that uh, Alice is trying to query on some index i, and the server reads almost the entire database, but just doesn't read a specific index j, right? Well, the server hasn't read this to index j, but has nonetheless answered Alice's query so that the server knows that it didn't just give Alice whatever's that index j because it, doesn't, it didn't even read it. <clears throat> so therefore the server knows that I is not equal to J. <clears throat> uh, so the notion of doubly efficient peer seeks to get around this limitation by instead of having the server store the database, just the database, the server will uh, store a pre-processed version of the database that is slightly larger. <clears throat> and so this concept was induced by, uh, by Malishai and Malkin in the year 2000, um, and so the idea is that the database is pre-processed into some static data structure that is uh, formed at the very beginning, like in some offline phase, and then all future queries use the same pre-processed data structure. And the pre-processing ideally should run in time that is, you know, only slightly super linear in, in the database size. <clears throat> um, Okay, and so then once the server has this pre-processed uh, data, like database, uh, the idea is that now Alice can make her query and the server can respond to this query reading only very few locations in the pre-processed data structure. Um, <clears throat> and so therefore like the total communication of the protocol as in the case, like the case of normal private information retrieval is polylogarithmic. And in addition, the server computation itself is uh, put ideally also polylogarithmic in, in the database size. <clears throat> um, okay, so the first evidence that uh, doubly efficient peer uh, exists uh, was given in two papers in 2017. Uh, and they give this a, a heuristic construction of uh, keyed D peer. And what this means is that uh, there is, they rely on a trusted third party to do the pre-processing of the database. So it turns the database into this db tilde, that is the pre-processed version. And then the third party distributes the pre-processed database to the server and a public key out to all uh, clients who wish to use the database. And only then can the, uh, can the peer protocol be run and allow the, the server to uh, server to answer peer queries in a fast fashion. And this is like somewhat unsatisfying because it makes this, it has this reliance on a trusted third party to, uh, to compute this pre-processing for you. And, you know, like you wouldn't really imagine, uh, you know, like the, the, the scheme security completely falls apart if you try to let the say, say let the server do the pre-processing. 
And so this is like unsatisfying in the case of say Netflix or uh, like, you know, Netflix responses because who else is gonna do this pre-processing but Netflix? Netflix is the person providing the service. So Ethan, you need yeah. a secret key, right? To decode the response? Um, yeah, so well, the, like it's a, essentially it's like a per, um, per session secret key. Like this, the client will sample some private secret and then you know use that to generate the query. And then once it gets the response, it will decrypt it using the private randomness. And that private randomness is no longer needed for future. This, this key could be uncorrelated with the public key. Yeah. Like in the sense, uh, it could be generatable just by knowing the public key, you could. Yeah, it. yeah. Um, and then so, and then one other unsatisfying thing about uh, these two works is that they are, they rely on both a new assumption uh, about, uh, an assumption about so-called permuted read Muller codes, and as well as a, a heuristic use of ideal obfuscation to, uh, like, to get it an additional layer to this public key function. And so our results are, uh, we get what we call unkeyed DPR or just normal DPR, where we get rid of this trusted third party. And what that means is that the, the server is able to just deterministically compute the pre-processing by itself. And then later, any client can just come and uh, run a DPR protocol with the server and query the database in a simple two-round protocol. And in case it's... Uh, like unclear, uh, pretty much all peer uh, protocols that we have that we think of are always this sort of two-round protocol, and the, ours is just the same. <clears throat> uh, and just a a remark a bit about this assumption. So the assumption that we use is is based on uh, ring learning with errors or ring LDBB, and this is assumption that is known to be as hard as uh, some worst case problems in ideal lattices. And it is a pretty well-studied assumption that is, uh, that is forming the basis of, of a new NIST standard for next generation uh, public key encryption. Uh, and in addition to this assumption, we get, um, we get deep here from a few other uh, assumptions, but uh, really like the, the main assumption that you should think about is, is from ring LWB. <clears throat> And to state the, the parameters that we get is for any uh, constant epsilon greater than zero and any database size, uh, we get a deep peer scheme where the pre-processing time and the size of the pre-processed database are both uh, you know, n to the one plus epsilon, so just slightly super linear in n. And the online runtime of the server and the online uh, communication are both polylogarithmic in n. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, we also give uh, an, we also provide a notion of uh, updatable deep here, where this is a notion where uh, the client makes some public update to the database, or say anyone is allowed to make some public update to the database. And really, all we want is that there's like some fast way to update the database uh, such that future deep here queries can go on afterwards after an update occurs. And and so what we achieve is that we uh, make a uh, achieve a world where we can do updates in n to the epsilon time. Uh, is there a dependence on lambda or the security parameter? Um, yeah, so like everything is poly lambda, okay. like all and suppressed. Yeah. Um, wait, the no, no, yeah, the the poly and lambda doesn't depend on epsilon. It's the just the poly the the exponent of the log n in right. uh. If I don't care about updatable deep theory, then I make epsilon to be a better version. Um, you don't care updatable. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, we also get an alternative regime where you can kind of make epsilon subconstant. Uh, but kind of the cost is that um, you like. Uh, you know, you wait. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, the cost is that you you take a hit on your online running time. Like you go from being polylog to n to the little o one in your online 
So like, so it's a, it's a trade-off between your pre-processing time and space and your online running time is, is what we have. Um, okay, and before I move on, I just wanna remark a bit about uh, some alternative like notions of, of similar objects that behave somewhat like DPR, but are, and like remark why they're unsatisfying for like this specific use case. And so one is uh, oblivious RAM or ORAM. Uh, this is a setting where a client is trying to outsource some random access memory to a server and hide all the accesses that it makes. And then there's also uh, this notion of private information retrieval with uh, a client pre-processing uh, notion. And kind of the, the fundamental thing here is that in both of these settings, um, there is there is like some per client cost that is incurred. So in ORAM, like the server storage actually grows for each client. Like it's kind of inherently of a more one-on-one -on -one sort of protocol and it doesn't support like a many client single server uh, scheme, uh, regime. And then peer with client pre-processing, the, the server, what it does is it pre-processes the database and produces some small hint that it sends to each client. And, um, and like it, and the hint is uh, important to be, like the hint needs to be kept private for each client that wants to keep their uh, queries private. Um, and so, and then if you imagine the fact that like the, the total runtime of the server is like between the offline and the online phase are, is amortized across all uh, peer queries, uh, you get that like the total server cost is only amortized to be small if the, if each client in each of these situations makes many queries. Whereas in our setting for unkey deep here, each client can make maybe only one, <clears throat> like only a few queries each. And uh, the real total, like, but even, you know, if there are enough clients, the total amortized cost of the server can be uh, as much, much small, can be very small. Okay. Uh, Pause here just a second. Does any like any have questions about kind of like the overall goal and setting for for deep here before I move on to the same for RAM FAG? So I, I still don't understand what's the trade off if you tune the parameter of epsilon. So like if you if you want to make epsilon smaller, uh, it in, increases the amount of time you have to spend during the online phase. So like essentially like. Making epsilon smaller makes your data structure smaller. And so like your data structure is like less useful. And so you need to spend more time in the online phase to actually use the data structure to do that. Oh, so, so you, you said that it's polylog, but it's actually also um, depending on epsilon, right? Yes, yeah, the, the exponent of the polylog does depend on, yeah, it does oh, depend on epsilon, I see. yeah. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so moving on to uh, the notion of, of RAM FHE. So the problem setting we're considering here is uh, that of like normal FHE largely. Uh, so Alice has some private input X and maybe there's a server that has some public input Y and Alice wants to learn the result, uh, the, the evaluation F of XY for some arbitrary function F. And um, and importantly, she does not want to reveal whatever her private info is. Like notably, this is uh, this is kind of a, a like a general, more general thing, like notion than private information retrieval. If you view it in this lens, uh, and similarly, it has like this trivial solution where the server could just send the entire public input over to Alice, and this is unsatisfying for maybe two reasons. First, the public input may just be very large. Uh, and second, uh, the problem is actually still interesting if there is no public input, and it just is the case that Alice just wants to outsource computation. She doesn't want to have to evaluate F by herself. Maybe F is very expensive. Um, and so this problem is solved by uh, fully homomorphic encryption, which has been you know, studied extensively. And the main idea is that, so Alice, you know, has some secret key and she uses her secret key to encrypt uh, whatever her private input is. And then the, the server then can compute the circuit that would, uh, or like can construct the circuit that would have compute the evaluation F of X, like F, like 
f you know with y uh, pre inputted into it. Uh, and then there is some mechanism in the fully homomorphic scheme that allows uh, the server to run this eval algorithm that evaluates this circuit applied to X, producing a ciphertext, which then it can send back to Alice. Alice can decrypt to get uh, her desired output. And so what is kind of known for this is that we can, you know, the client time and communication kind of is independent of the runtime of F, uh, like how long it takes to compute F, and really only depends on you know, her, uh, Alice's input and the output size. Uh, however, the, like this caveat that comes up once again is that the server's runtime, because we're in the circuit, uh, circuit model, is at least as large as the circuit is, which since the circuit contains Y is at least as large as the, this uh, public input Y. And so the notion of RAM FHE is we want kind of all the same benefits of uh, normal circuit FHE, and we want it to kind of work exactly the same, but with, uh, or ideally we only want to, like we want to now think of like computing F as some RAM program. And we want that the server's runtime only depends on the run RAM running time and not uh, necessarily the input size Y and, and X. And um, what is, it, it, it turns out to be necessary here that the server will need to pre-process this, uh, this public input Y into some data structure. And the reason for this is much the same as the reason for the, the, the peer lower bound that you need to store more than just Y because say the computation asks you to look up some index in Y. Uh, if you didn't look up, if you didn't touch this piece place in memory, you didn't look up that index. Um, but otherwise, we want it to be pretty much exactly the same as normal circuit FHE. And so our, kind of our best hope for like efficiency parameters here is that the pre-processing time is purely just, you know, roughly linear in Y. The client communication is just the same as it was in circuit FHE. And this, but the server time is only dependent on the, um, on the, the worst case running time of the RAM computation. <clears throat> and so the main advantages here over circuit FHE kind of correspond to like the three aspects that RAM programs have an advantage over regular circuits. For instance, that, so we could handle some large public database because the, um, the RAM program has random access to this uh, input Y. Um, additionally, if there was no public input at all, uh, but Alice just had some large database she wanted to outsource computation on. We can also handle that where the RAM program has uh, read write, uh, random read write access, or sorry, random read access to X. And potentially even if both X and Y are short and we actually wouldn't incur some, such a large cost of thinking about them in the circuit model, uh, it's pot, you know, there's still a general quadratic loss in going from RAM computation to the circuit model. And since the RAM computation has read write access to some internal memory, like random access to some internal memory, um, we can potentially save this quadratic hit in uh, converting from a RAM program to a circuit. In uh, so, do you mention RAM program uh, like a worst? Case than I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, do you work with specific representation of RAM programs or like? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what is that? So, so the way we're thinking of RAM programs as we have like some step circuit, which computes, <clears throat> uh, you know, at each at each step, will like store some local memory, but then also produce indices that want that it's trying to read from X, Y, and whatever it's like read write memory is. And, and also like a write index and a value. Yeah, and, and you then, just truncate it at T. Uh, yeah, yeah. We just view that it, it always ends after T steps. And like, like, you know, inherently we need to take worst case runtime at all times because maybe if I abort early, I'll have learned that it was an input that I abort early on. And perhaps if you had ideal obfuscation and all that, you could still get something meaningful with input specific and right? Um, the runtime reveals uh, something about by default. Uh, yeah, like for two machines with uh, with same uh, behavior on all inputs, you could argue that 
uh, encryption of this uh, would look indistinguishable when looking at that. Yeah, but uh, I mean, that's uh, like a sample. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we don't. Uh, no, but, but I'm, I'm just saying it, it's not clear whether this is lost. It's impossible. Like getting something meaningful for where dependence is not in the worst case spending time. Yeah, sure. You can yeah. buy like the yeah. time is uh, a few years. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But uh, that will make sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would definitely. Yeah, yeah. We didn't, we didn't consider this, but yeah, I guess it's not. Okay. It's not inherently. We just important. don't know how to solve that problem yet. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Okay. Uh. And so, um. Uh, the prior work on RAM FHE is uh, quite small. There was mostly just this one paper from 2019 that uh, gave the first evidence that RAM FHE is something that could be possible. Um, and I, however, this uh, this um, this paper only produces a heuristic construction of a weaker variant of RAM FHE, where there is no like public server input. And so, maybe as like kind of at a high level, this. Like this notion of RAM FHE doesn't necessarily solve like the encrypted Google search problem because Google couldn't pre-process like pre-process its its database ahead of time. It has to do it for each uh, like secret key or like for each um, like for each invocation of a of a query. Uh, and it like at a very very high level, kind of the way this uh, construction worked is that it uses normal circuit FHE to evaluate steps on the step, like in the RAM computation. And it has a makes black box use of a keyed deep ear scheme where, and it kind of just uses uh, ideal obfuscation to kind of fuse these two objects together. And uh, Wei Kai will get a, give a little bit more of the details of, of how, that, um, how that construction works and kind of how our construction improves on it. Um, or addresses those challenges that it, uh, it, used, it presents. But just to state our result, our result is that we construct RAM FHE from ring LWE, as well as uh, you know, normal cir circular security assumptions about uh, that are required for even normal FHE. And to state our parameters uh, for any epsilon, any constant epsilon, uh, we have, just like in deep area we have pre-processing time, it takes us uh, you know, y to the one plus epsilon time to um, to preprocess the public input. Then the client communication is you know just barely super linear, and it's the client input times some polylog factors. And then the server runtime is again just uh, slightly uh, slightly super linear in the RAM program worst case runtime. Um, what does that mean by the size of the app? Like the just the how long in bits the output like yeah it's I mean RAM computation is like annoying to work with sometimes because it's kind of unclear what you want to define as the output of computation it could be really long it could be short but but yeah so you you can play around with this a little bit to get like depending on exactly what sort of RAM program you want to run but um but yeah and and we also can like. Just as before, we can do things where we play around whether epsilon is a constant or is subconstant, and we get slightly different parameter regimes. But uh, yeah. why, why do you need circular security just because there's no bound on the time? Yeah. So so uh, yeah, we can get uh, yeah. So level. yeah, we can get a level notion. Uh, but in the level notion, uh, the the client time actually is is depends on the the time t. So, but yes, we can get a level push. Yeah. Okay, um, moving on. Um, so now I'm just gonna give like a kind of a high level overview of how our deep ear construction works. <clears throat> and the, the very high template, like high level template here is that we're gonna combine two ingredients. The first is like a very simple peer based on homomorphic encryption. Like I kind of already remarked before that you know, F, like homomorphic encryption gives you like is a more general case than peer. And so we're kind of essentially going to leverage that with some minor caveats uh, and combine it with a, a, a more algorithmic view where we have this, there's this technique from Kedlaya Umans and uh, to 2008 that talks about how to pre-process polynomial evaluation. And the idea is that we're going to use this to speed up the server's runtime. And so our main contribution here is like, getting these things to play nice together. 
And uh, maybe in particular, and like kind of looking ahead, uh, just to kind of skip skip one of like the failed attempts, uh, we're gonna, instead of considering fully homomorphic encryption as like this peer, we're instead just gonna think of somewhat homomorphic encryption for, for what we care about now. Um, and kind of the idea here is that like every fully homomorphic scheme that we know kind of inherently is gonna rely on some non-algebraic things like uh, things to do uh, non-algebraic operations in order to perform evaluation. And uh, this will like make it not play nice with the, the other side of, of the techniques. And so, uh, but for those you may not know the, what, the, uh, what the somewhat homomorphic encryption means is that we're restricting ourselves to only being allowed to evaluate low degree functions. Um, but you know, we'll choose degrees large enough that we'll just still be able to index into our database because that's all we care about. And so what we do is, uh, so our like this very basic peer scheme based on some homomorphic encryption is we start by having Alice write uh, I and base D. Say for now, just think of D is equal to two. We're gonna have to play with this parameter later, but um, so she just writes uh, all the digits of her index. And, uh, and meanwhile, the server views uh, the database as a polynomial over ZD, such that, you know, if like it's an M variant polynomial uh, corresponding to like the entire size of the database. And if you evaluate it on elements in ZD that form like uh, an integer I, like that are the digits of an integer I, it evaluates to the, to the database at that point. And so essentially you can kind of create this polynomial simply just by interpolating over the entire database. And just a, a note is that uh, FDB has individual degree less than this, this D um, and it must have at least N coefficients in order to be like to allow it to interpolate for the every all the endpoints in the database. And so we get that like this polynomial um, satisfies like D to the N is at least N. Okay, so individual degree means degree the degree in each variable. Each yeah, yeah. Total degree could be. D. Yeah, the total degree is D is like at most D times n. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, and so just that you know how the way this will work, right? Is Alice just samples some secret key and sends over encryptions of each of these uh, of the digits of the index she wants to read. And then the server can just use the evaluation algorithm for the summon homomorphic scheme to evaluate the, this polynomial at, uh, at those digits, which produces uh, an, a ciphertext that decrypts to the desired index, uh, location in the database. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and so like we just like, Modulo being a bit careful about how we set what total degree we're all able to handle for the somewhat homomorphic scheme, this just works as a peer construction. And uh, so the kind of the second part here is that we want to use this technique, which is actually this very beautiful technique from Kedlai and Umans, uh, to pre-process polynomial evaluation. And so say I have uh, an M-variate polynomial that's each has, uh, that has individual degree D, uh, I like the the claim here is that you can pre-process this polynomial into a data structure that allows us to afterwards quickly evaluate the polynomial uh, on any input in the in what in the the ring that it's over. And what and so what I mean by you know this data structure and how quickly? Uh, well, first note that you know sticking with like the same variable names, uh, this is a this polynomial has like at most n coefficients. And so like we think, you know, the total size of this polynomial is like kind of n log q, like for like bit length of all of its description. And so our pre-processing time is that it, assuming that n is small enough, this, uh, you know, the pre-processing time is, is like only a little bit larger than linear in the, in the polynomial's description length. And the evaluation time is poly, uh, polynomial in D, M, and log Q, which is like logarithmic in the polynomial's um, description length. 
And uh, actually just a minor note that we probably won't touch on that much, but it's important for us getting our ring LWE construction is that uh, more, more so than just working over rings of the form ZQ, it works over some larger class of rings, like including like taking an extension and modding out uh, a copolynomial extension and modding out by some small one. And uh, for our purposes, what we really want is we want that like the pre-processing time and space is only like slightly super linear in N. And so this, this factor that has like an M to the M factor here is, is like really painful. And so we just need M to be very small. So we want M to be like sub-logarithmic. And so the way that we'll end up setting parameters is we'll choose D to be a prime that is something like uh, log to the C of N. Um, <clears throat> and then M is log base D of N. So it's like log N over log log N. And we'll, uh, we'll also have like ring size that is, you know, has like, so that ring elements have description length poly log N. <clears throat> um, and so in this regime, we get that the, the pre-processing time and space uh, is, you know, end of the one plus epsilon kind of as we want, and that the evaluation time is poly log N. So the indices that you're gonna store won't be binary, it will be some like larger, yeah. Larger range. Yeah. To do the poly log. Um, wait, so the. So like if you do the <coughs> uh, polynomial size data would require log n bits and you can't afford that, right? Because M could only. Yeah, be. yeah. So you choose those indices to live in like. The, so the indices, the, the, the digits of like the digits that we're gonna be using live in ZD. So like they're, they're base D, like if you take a base D representation. Okay. Yeah, and, and then like, the ultimately like the ciphertext space is going to be a ring of this size. That's the whole purpose. Like uh, uh, if we don't reduce the number of variables m, then our space here will be super linear, super polynomial, and uh, that's not good for our purpose. Mm. So we really want uh, m be small, and uh, that will drive the degree up. Yeah. Also. Yeah. So we can't. Yeah, we can't handle constant size degree. While still having, um, you know, uh, poly. <clears throat> okay, and so now the question is like, so this is our our uh, basic peer scheme, and like, can we just plug it in, like plug in this uh, pre-processing technique? And uh, the answer is not quite yet. And the idea is right, like that the the server isn't actually just computing this polynomial f, so we can't just have it evaluate the polynomial itself. It's actually just comp it's computing the SHE eval function on F, and and so we we can't yet use this technique to pre-process the service computation, and but what we what we really want is we just want that uh, we want an an SHE scheme that has the property that the evaluating in this FHE scheme like rep respects algebraic operations, and like that's exactly what we introduce. It's this, uh, which we call algebraic summit homomorphic encryption. And this is a notion of homomorphic encryption where uh, we have, you know, some plain text space and the ciphertext space is actually a ring itself. And what this permits is that, like, uh, if ring operations in the ciphertext space respect uh, encryption and decryption operations of the scheme. And, um, and so since if we respect both addition and multiplication, <clears throat> um, and like, you know, this is like addition and multiplications in this ring R, uh, then assuming that, you know, the modulo some like error growth and some maximal total degree, uh, we can actually evaluate an entire like low degree multivariate polynomial over the ciphertext. And, and essentially like the way that you evaluate it is exactly like, I have a bunch of ciphertexts and I have a polynomial. I just evaluate that polynomial over the ciphertexts, thinking of the ciphertexts as ring elements, <clears throat> where this F evaluation is just some like lifted version of R. So I just like lift from ZD up to whatever the ciphertext spaces are. And I just do an evalu like evaluation of this polynomial. <clears throat> and so like, this is, this is kind of very key here where we're making it so that the server's co like computation really is just evaluating a polynomial. And it's like just evaluating a polynomial over just 
a bunch of inputs that it gets from the client. And so just a note is that uh, since this is like a somewhat homomorphic scheme, like the complexity of everything here is allowed to depend on the, the total degree of this polynomial, but kind of as noted before that like the total degree of the polynomial that we actually want to evaluate is D times M, like is little D times M, which is uh, polylogarithmic in, in the database size. <clears throat> so R is the ring where the ciphertext lives. Yes. And you were sorry. saying that this is of size two to the polylog n. Yeah. Does that mean extreme from like strong security assumption? Like um does it translate to uh, it's like our ciphertext that is uh, at least uh long as our security parameter. So there is a two to security parameter factor in the big size R. Can you slide, like, can you see the previous slide? Where you set the parameters? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah. this one. So, R is 2 to the polylog n times. 2 to the polylog n times. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. taking log R is like a security from the ciphertext size of the, the yeah. ciphertext you want to. Yeah, I'm kind of like always suppressing security parameter here just for. Um, okay, and so like, the way that we'll get this algebraically homomorphic encryption is that we actually just notice that uh, many of like the early um, kind of, um, I think this is, this is generation two, no, generation two good. like homomorphic encryption schemes are uh, actually like kind of very can, very, can be very simply modified to actually just completely respect um, uh, algebraic operations and kind of like the idea is that like many of these schemes really what they do is they like they actually like naturally would and then they have some method of uh, you know lowering the error growth and all we do is we just say we're going to let all the error growth happen limit our uh, and like limit the degree small enough that we're fine and so our main construction is based on the Rokursky and Vikernathan scheme from uh, 2011, and this is based on ring LWE, and this gives uh, our like our strongest construction. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to give this uh, slightly simpler one, uh, which is based on the approximate GCD assumption. <clears throat> and so, what is the scheme? So our ciphertext space is just integers. Um, we'll I'll remark on this in just a minute, but like so, just think of ciphertext as just being integers. And so I think of like uh, the number line of all the integers and I'm gonna divide it up into like three intervals. So I've got some small integers, medium integers and large integers. And so my C here will be like a medium sized integer that I choose such that uh, it is one mod D for where D is like our, uh, our plain text space and it is small. <clears throat> and then to encrypt things, I take a large integer and I take a small error and I like multiply the large, like, you know, this, this large A times the secret key. And I also multiply, but, all right, and then I add like some small error that is, uh, has residue zero mod D. And then I add the, the message, the plain text message. And then to decrypt here, all I'm gonna do is I just mod out by S and then mod out by D. Successively. And because S is equal to one mod D, like you kind of think that this is, this is hiding because like if I don't have S, I can't get rid of S and fully recover. Um, but so if I do know S, I can just mod out by S, which kills off the AS term, mod out by D, which kills off the error term, and I recover my message. <clears throat> um, and it's relatively simple to see here that if I just, like if I take these ciphertexts and I add or multiply them, I get, uh, ciphertexts that encrypt the, addi uh, the addition or the multiplication of the underlying plain texts, uh, mod D. <clears throat> and so, you know, assuming that, uh, that like I choose a polynomial that has small enough degree that uh, evaluating a bunch, like this polynomial over small integers never reaches a medium integer, I get no wrapper on mod S. And so I have like correctness of evaluating some polynomial. Uh, and the security of the scheme is based on, uh, you know, some assumption called approximate GCD, which I'm just going to kind of skip. Um, it's a pretty simple 
uh, assumption. But uh, yeah. And then just a note. Uh, so here we're thinking of like separate text as integers. Um, and we don't really want that because we want like our cipher text space to be finite. And so, but we can just choose a large enough Q and just treat cipher text as elements in ZQ for, so, and we just choose Q large enough that there will be no wraparound. <laughs> and this is fine as long as you just, you know, like Q is going to be like roughly two to a poly D. <clears throat> With a, yeah. <clears throat> and so um, our final deep peer construction is we're just going to take this, you know, exactly this basic peer scheme that we saw before, and we're going to use an ASHE uh, uh, scheme as our underlying somewhat homomorphic encryption. And so therefore, like the server, instead of evaluate, like is going to lift the database polynomial into the ciphertext space and then pre-process it with uh, the KU pre-processing techniques. And then to evaluate, it now is literally just evaluating a polynomial over the ciphertexts. And then, and so once this is the case, we can now apply the pre-processing and use the pre-processing to, to speed up this computation to being much, much faster. So you don't have the circuit right now? What? So where, where's the circuit? Where's the circuit? So the circuit is... Well, yeah, um, yeah, right. there's a, yeah, there's this polynomial that is being, yeah, wait, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, the, yeah, we're just thinking of polynomials instead of circuits, I guess, if oh, that's, okay. if that's helpful. Um, yeah, and so this polynomial we're evaluating is, is exactly this database polynomial, and we have pre-processed it in advance so that we can actually just evaluate it much faster. Um, and so, so that's that's essentially the conclusion of our our deep peer construction. That's entirely how it works. Um, and so, just as a teaser for what's happening, what's going to be coming up after lunch. Uh, so, Wakai will give a you know a, a description of of our RAM FHE construction at a reasonably high level and like a kind of like a simplified version, and then some comments on how we get the full version. And then also he'll show you a, a proof of this uh, this KU preprocessing technique, and um, I I really believe that this this KU technique is is incredibly beautiful and it's it's something that you know if you walk away from this talk like with one algorithm in mind like I think this is like what you should think of this is it's a very beautiful technique that is actually very simple to understand uh, and and Wakai will give a, a a good explanation of it in the second half. Okay. Uh, that concludes uh, the talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, what's like the typical, like, are these things implementable? The KU08, can you say what are like the real life parameters? Um, yeah, so. My default answer is going to be no. Um, and so it's like, um, what is it? It's the, the exponent in. Um, so there are what is two it? things, right? Like uh, the number of variables m maybe could be small to make a smaller space. But uh, if we drive this number small, we get a smaller space in this epsilon. But uh, the time will be like a polynomial like raised to the exponent of one over epsilon. So uh, that means if you want to drive epsilon to one tenth, the exponent on the polynomial is like 10. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is not a very good uh, space time to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, for practically quantum size, this. Uh, uh, from interpreting this polynomial is just uh, so large. I think it would be helpful if you could plug in some, like, just like you said, some practical problem size and calculate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be very Yeah, helpful. let's say n is uh, to the 40 and uh, epsilon is 0.5. Then n to the one plus at one point five is like two to the sixty. That's huge, right? It's space. And then my time is like uh, 
polynomial to the power of uh, say two or three. That's not too bad, but uh, we have other factors. So yeah, so and it will go up soon, like. Uh, to the power of <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of, and kind of also kind of is like a baseline, like these, the polylog, like the, the exponent in the polylog is like a lot of times we're seeing things like uh, it's like D and M both raised to like the power three is a kind of a baseline. And then, you know, you kind of tune your parameters uh, uh, from there, kind of. Where's the barrier of this going to be? Is to be, to be practical, is it in the polynomial group processing scheme or the B theory? Um, I think you can kind of think of either, like there are ideas, you can have ideas to improve on either aspect. Cause like, like, it's kind of like how you're tuning parameters so that they fit together. Oh, and, right. and so if you, um, and you can, you can consider making adjustments on kind of either side that could make this, this fit better. And so, um, yes, you, you could like, yeah. Yeah, you can improve one of the two building blocks and uh, you can try to optimize both for this specific uh, decision. Uh, but, uh, I mean, we don't have a better way to do it to get uh, more, into, more efficient than the field itself. Uh, has this trick been used anywhere else previously or just? Um, so yes, right. Uh, uh, if you are asking KU polynomial preprocessing, yes, um, but uh, they are not uh, highly cited. But uh, if you are asking the composition, no, 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 no. I'm just asking this. Yeah, what's like, other context? Like KU is cited like a hundred times, so that's good. But uh, I was uh, surprised by the number. I expect higher, so. The in crypto context, has it been used for? I, th I don't I, really know. Yeah. I, to my, the best of my I think there are, I've seen some papers that have cited it, but I don't really think they're making heavy use so of it so much. I can say the original paper is to solve like the big problem, like a polynomial ring, like a polynomial composition and the modular reduce. So that's totally algebraic, uh, and uh, I know nothing about the crypto application. But uh, I mean, one immediate uh, application I came up with looking at this result is you can uh, reprocess a NYC independent uh, function. Yeah. Like an NYC independent function is uh, a polynomial. Yeah. If you have the NYC and then you want to evaluate later, you can process and maybe a later NYC evaluation test. And uh, likely, you use the NYC, you will evaluate this NYC many times later, like n times. So this will help you in that scenario, and uh, depending on how large and is in your application. 